One, two, one, two, three, four. Hey everybody, it's Sam Jacobs. Welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. Today on the show, we've got Dr. Gleb Sapersky. And and Dr. Gleb is a well-known author, and he talks about the importance of understanding human cognitive bias, which is basically a way of saying that our brains are evolved over millennia and uh, modern civilization is a fairly recent creation from that millennia. And most of the time we have built in evolutionary impulses, which we can no longer trust implicitly when it comes to making decisions. And so we're going to have a conversation and he's specifically going to relate it to his new book, which talks all about how to avoid cognitive bias when dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're excited for that. Before we get there, we want to thank our sponsor, our sponsor, our first sponsor for today is LinkedIn. Sales teams have had to quickly adapt to a new normal. With limits on in-person meetings, it's even more important to double down on your digital selling strategy. Sales leaders must shift their focus to empowering talent, strengthening customer relationships, and acquiring new opportunities in order to survive and thrive in this environment. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a relationship-based digital selling tool that's designed to help you do just that. You can help your sales teams increase their pipeline win rates and deal sizes. Go to sales.linkedin.com to try it out for yourself. Our second sponsor is Outreach, the number one sales engagement platform. Outreach revolutionizes customer engagement by moving away from siloed conversations to a streamlined and customer-centric journey. Leveraging the next generation of artificial intelligence, the platform allows sales reps to deliver consistent, relevant, and responsible communication for each prospect every time, enabling personalization at scale that was previously unthinkable. And by the way, we just turned saleshacker.com into a community so we can all learn and be better together. Rather than just reading or listening, you can now ask questions and get amazing thoughtful answers from other B2B sales professionals who have been there before. Plus, you can share your experience with others. Go to saleshacker.com to create your member profile today. Now let's listen to my conversation with Dr. Gleb Sapersky. Hey, everybody. It's Sam Jacobs. Welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. Today on the show, we've got an author and a doctor, Dr. Gleb Sipersky, or Sipersky, but we're gonna we're just gonna call him Dr. Gleb uh, th- for the next uh, 25, 30, 35 minutes. But let me tell you a little bit about this kind doctor. He's an internationally recognized thought leader known as the disaster avoidance expert, which it's very important to avoid disasters. And he's on a mission to protect leaders from dangerous judgment errors known as cognitive biases. By developing the most effective decision-making strategies, his cutting-edge thought leadership has been featured in over 550 articles and 450 interviews in the likes of Fast Company, CBS News, Time, and many others. His expertise stems from over 20 years of consulting, coaching, speaking, and training, and he's also done significant amounts of research. He's written a number of books. The most recent book that we're going to talk about today is called Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. Dr. Gleb, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you inviting me on, Sam. Thank you very much. We're excited to have you. So the first thing that we like to do is we like uh, we call it your baseball card. It's it's in some ways a repackaging of the bio that I just read. But, you know, we'd like to hear it from your lips, not from my lips. So give us a little bit of, of context. Tell us the company or the practice that you're that you're working on right now. And then, of course, we want to hear about the book. So give us a synopsis of the book and then we'll dive into some more some more substantive questions. Sounds great to me. The company I run is called Disaster Avoidance Experts, and I'm the CEO. I've been doing work on disaster avoidance, which is four areas, decision-making, risk management, disaster planning and management, and strategic planning for about 20 years now, doing consulting, coaching, and training. And I've also spent 15 years in academia as a cognitive neuroscientist and behavioral economist researching these questions. And you know what? The, we know is it's very clear that disasters of various sorts, problems of various sorts, come from decisions. There are t- two types of decisions that lead to disasters. One is our active decision, where we actively made a decision that eventually resulted in a disaster. You know, for example, the way that Boeing made a decision to release the 737 MAX without thoroughly checking it. That's a disaster. Another sort of disaster, which I talk more about in the book, is when we fail to make decisions that avoid a disaster, that prevent a disaster, that prepare for a disaster. Since we're talking about airlines, a, a good example is how airlines have been hugely profitable from 2008 to 2009, 
But they chose to not save this money for a rainy day just in case, as many smart companies did. But they all used it to buy back shares from their shareholders, increasing the shareholder value, but leaving themselves with an empty war chest. And as COVID-19 came around, they were left high and dry and they had to go to government hat in hand to borrow money. So that is a big problem. And that's the kind of disaster that you don't avoid. <laughs> that you <should laughs> you So, so let's dive into the book a little bit, because obviously, you know, there's a lot to talk about. But I guess, first of all, so, you know, just recapping what you just said, there's 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 active decision making disasters and then there's the not making a decision disaster. Tell us about the book that you just wrote, and then I, I have a bunch of questions for you. So tell us about the the, the Resilience book and, and walk us through it. So Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic, looks at how we made such atrociously bad decisions that led to the disaster of re our response to COVID-19. Of course, COVID-19 came out of a situation where there are a number of countries that responded really well. Compare, for example, the U.S. to South Korea. The U.S. has 330 million people. South Korea has 60 million people. We found the first case of COVID-19 in the U.S. and in South Korea on the same day. But right now, South Korea has less than 300 deaths from COVID-19. And the U.S. has over 100,000 deaths. You know, if our populations were comparable, the U.S. should have had, and the U.S. handled this as competently as South Korea, we should have had less than 1,500 deaths. Very obviously, on a societal level, our society screwed up. And at an individual level, very many people screwed up. They made bad decisions, businesses, companies, individuals made really bad decisions, financial decisions, all sorts of decisions. So I... I, in the book, I analyze why we make such bad decisions. Why do we actually make such bad decisions? What is the problem with our brain, our thinking patterns, our feeling patterns that cause us to make such bad decisions? Then analyze that, look at all the timelines for individuals, for businesses, for our society as a whole. Then I look at the kind of br processes, brain processes that cause us to make these bad decisions and how we can address them, how we can avoid them. These are called cognitive biases. Dangerous judgment errors, mental blind spots that neuroscientists and behavioral economists like myself call cognitive biases. So look at those, look at the specific ones that have sent us into a tailspin, and then look at how we should actually adapt to the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. A lot of people are doing it in very bad ways, very problematic ways, not responding to it correctly at all, you know, thinking that everything will go back to normal, going opening things up really bad. Then I talk about how do we adapt as individuals, how do we adapt as companies and organizations, then how do we make a strategic plan to survive and thrive through the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic? What are the actual steps we should take? And finally, how do we make good decisions major decisions on various choices within the strategic plan. So that's the shape of the book. Analyzes the problem, talks about the underlying theory behind the problem, then goes into solutions, and then strategic plan to adapt the solutions, make sure that you survive and thrive the pandemic and the post-pandemic transition. Okay. It sounds obviously topical and timely. So let's dive into it. Why do you think we were so badly prepared for, and why do you think we underestimated the pandemic and walk us through what you think sort of is structural in the, in the human DNA or the neurological system that, that, that triggers these types of responses? Unfortunately, we were all taught to go with our gut as when we make our decisions. Follow your gut, trust your intuitions, follow your heart, all of these sorts of things. Well, that is actually very bad advice, what the modern research in cognitive neuroscience and behavioral economics reveals. We should not trust our gut. Our gut is not adapted for the modern environment. That's not what it's for. It's adapted for the savanna environment when we were hunters and gatherers living in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people. That is problematic. And we suffer from many dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases, as I mentioned before. The biggest, the biggest problem in response to the pandemic is called the normalcy bias. So the normalcy bias causes us to assume that the future will be much like the past. In the savanna environment, that, that was a safe assumption. You know, you would have those cycles of, of na nature cycles where you have winter, fall, summer, whatever. You need to prepare for all of those. And you will still live in the cave, you know, 10 years, whatever, if you're still alive. So it was a safe assumption that the future would be much like today. Unfortunately, that's not a safe assumption anymore. We have very much 
living in a different world where progress is very fast, technology is very fast, and that is one dynamic of change. But another dynamic of change is these major disruptors that can really change our lives very quickly. For example, the 2008-2009 fiscal crisis was indeed a major disruptor, and people were not prepared for it, did not respond to it well. Neither are people responding well to the to this disruptor. The normalcy bias caused individuals, businesses, governments to fail to prepare for such catastrophes, both their likelihood and their impact, because we can't viscerally imagine the kind of changes that are accompanying something like COVID-19. Many people still don't. They want to get back to a state of normalcy. They want to go back to normal. And you could see this normalcy bias playing out in real life. I'm looking at people and I'm saying, wow, you're just so very much, very much falling for this very dangerous judgment error. We're never going back to December 2019. There's no normalcy. There's absolutely no way we're going back there. The only way to address COVID-19 is through a vaccine. And we will not have a vaccine until the end of 2021 at the earliest possible kind of widely available vaccine. Seen, you know, maybe approval by summer 2021, something like that, you know, spring 2021, and then you know, at least six months to produce enough food for everyone. So we're into the end of 2021. And that's if everything goes really well. And think about what our society is like when we're, if we have to deal with COVID-19 for all of this time, various levels of restrictions, loosenings, it will be very hard, very difficult. And people don't realize that they still want to get back to normal. Well, they absolutely do. So how do you think we should shift our thinking to deal with the reality of the pandemic? What we need to do is you want to adopt a realistic, even a pessimistic perspective. You don't want to be nearly as optimistic as many people are about the pandemic. You want to realize the facts about the pandemic. It's highly, highly contagious that the infection doubles every three to six days in any outbreak that's not suppressed. Therefore, what we'll be facing over the next year plus at least is waves of restriction of loosening so right now we're in a state of loosenings and uh, things are opening up but then as COVID-19 cases creep up there will eventually be in most regions some sort of restrictions once again and it's hard to envision right now those restrictions but think about this COVID-19 with great hospital treatment all the things that we have available it has a death rate of something like 0.5 to 1%. 0.5 on the lower bounds of estimates, 1% on the higher bounds of estimates. But let's even take the the lower bounds of 0.5%. So that's 0.5%. That's current. That's how we got to 100,000 plus. Now, what we know is that about of all people who get sick, including people who are asymptomatic, five to 10% need to go to the hospital. And what happens when hospitals are overwhelmed is that these people die. So the death rate essentially shoots up from 5.5 to 1% to five to 10%, 10 times as much. That's what happened in Northern Italy when hospitals became overwhelmed. And most politicians will just not let it happen. That's just not the reality of the situation that we're facing. That, you know, whatever you think it's moral, whatever you think it's not, you know, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about politicians. That they can't stand the political, uh, how it looks to have bodies and refrigerated trucks outside of hospitals has happened in New York City. So they will have restrictions. And that's what we're facing. We are facing these waves of restrictions. But that's not the worst thing. So so restrictions, loosenings, restrictions, loosenings until vaccine. But vaccine might not be available. You know, everything might not go perfectly well. We might not have it by the end of 2021. If things don't go as well as we would like, things might we might not have a vaccine until 22, 23, 24. You know, what most people don't realize is that the large majority of vaccines historically have not succeeded, have not gone through the first the human trials, you know, the second batch or third batch of vaccines. It might very well be the case here, and that would get us in a lot of trouble, 23, 24, 25. And that's a scenario that you need to prepare for. You might want to hope for the best, by the end of 2021, that's the best, even though people might not think that that's the best. That is the best. But you want to prepare for the worst. And the worst takes us into, you know, 25 and later. So you want to be prepared 
for your in, yourself as an individual, your household, your business, your organization, the government, all need to be prepared for this going into 25 or later. You want to prepare for the worst while even hoping for the best. And that's the realistic, pessimistic perspective that you need to take to understand what is going on in the future and how all of our social norms and habits and perspectives will change drastically and how you want to be ahead of this shift. So, I mean, I understand that you want to be prepared, but what does that mean, practically speaking? Does that mean save more money, spend less? And I'm asking because, you know, the economy, particularly the U.S. economy, is driven by consumer demand first and foremost. So, you know, one of the issues that people had with the stimulus is that uh, people say, well, not people, one of the issues with the stimulus is that people actually saved a meaningful percentage of it instead of spending it. So I guess my question is when you're saying prepare for the worst and be a realistic pessimist, what are you saying from an economic perspective is my question. Should we just prepare and buckle up for, you know, sustained, I don't know, 15, 20, 25, 30% unemployment for the next two years? Or mm-hmm. what's your economic prescription? So there are a couple of questions there for individuals, economic, uh, but let, let's take the economic one, the last one first. Yes, I think we'll have unemployment of 15 to 20% in the next uh, for the next couple of years until somewhere if we get really lucky then until we start vaccination in summer of 2021 something like that so at least a year of 15 percent unemployment very likely and that's very optimistic and very likely longer unemployment if we don't get super lucky with the early vaccine so that's the first thing to realize we are in a bad bad spot economically then what individuals can do about it one of the things that i have trouble with is when government figures tell individuals, you need to go out and spend, spend, spend. And that, of course, they're essentially asking them to sacrifice on behalf of everyone else. I mean, that's not a smart thing to do. You want to help yourself and your family first and foremost. That's the perspective that people should take. And that's the perspective that I advise all of my clients to take. You know, so you want to help yourself, your business, your organization first and foremost. Don't spend and think that, you know, hey, I'm just going to help society by spending. You want to focus on yourself. You want to do the most good for yourself. How do you do that? It, you should spend, but you should spend smartly. You should spend in the right way. One of the things that people should prepare for is be ready for a situation of an outbreak in your area. I mean, depending on where you are politically, your I, mean, I don't mean your personal values. I mean, your government, whatever happens there, there's going to be certain politics around that influence how much the pandemic progresses before there's going to be a restriction in place. And it might well get as bad as New York City, where you live. I have no idea where you live, but if it gets as bad as that, you want to be prepared for that sort of situation. What does that mean? Well, you want to stock on on supplies. You certainly don't want to be going out to the store in that sort of situation. So I don't recommend that people empty the shelves of grocery stores. I recommend that they get they go online, buy in bulk various goods, products that they can use. So ensure that you have physical safety, cleaning supplies, medications that you need, and so on. You also want to prepare and protect your mental safety. Now, what does that mean, your mental well-being? Well, you need to replace the kind of entertainment and exercises you used to do outside or with other people by indoor solitary activities in case of extreme lockdowns or self-quarantines due to COVID-19 in your household. And that, of course, takes money as well, the physical preparation and the mental preparation. So you want to be able to, that's spending some money on your mental well-being and replacing those sorts of entertainment. You know, sports is not going to be going on. You can't go to a sports game. All of those sorts of things. Gyms are going to be closed in many places. All of those things you want to be able to replace. So that is, those are things that you want to be thinking about Now, you also want to be thinking about protecting your relationships with members of your family, with your friends, and so on. How do you protect your relationships in that sort of context? And that's a place where you can spend some money, too, on getting various virtual interactions, various fun things that you can do together virtually with other people. And, of course, you can 
invest in your own hobbies. So that's going to be an important thing. So hobbies, I'm, I'm spending a whole lot more money on gardening this year than I spent in previous years. It's going to be both more fun and, of course, produce some food for me in case of a troublesome situation. So those are the kinds of things where I think it would be smart to spend money, but you're spending money on your safety and on risk management, not simply on, you know, go out and buy luxuries. Okay. Do you have any concern or, or uh, yeah, concern about mental well-being and mental health? If I mean, well, I guess a couple of things. The first thing is that you know, from what I've read, the the disease is far less contagious outside than inside. Like confined, closed spaces are where uh, it spreads more easily. So there's a strong argument to be made that people should that it's okay to spend time outside to go to the beach or go to the park as long as yeah. you're practicing social distancing. Do you Definitely. agree with that? Yep, absolutely. So what the research shows is that, yes, going to the beach, going outside is fine as long as you're practicing social distancing. And if for some reason you can't practice social distancing, certainly wear a mask. But ideally, practice social distancing. Ten feet is the best distance. Six feet doesn't quite cut it if somebody if somebody sneezes or coughs, basically. Six feet is okay if they only breathe. But if they talk, they sneeze, they cough, you want to do ten feet. So, yes, ten feet outside that's good. That's safe. That's fine. You want to spend the you you want to spend time outside as mo, as much as you reasonably can. That's good for mental health, mal, mental well being. But of course, a lot of things that people want to be doing are inside, <laughs> indoors, and that's going to be a tough thing to do. So there's indoor is actually much less safe. So recent research shows that it's much less safe than we tend to think because just ten feet of social distancing doesn't do it. The problem is that if somebody, even if they don't cough, even if they don't, don't sneeze, and of course they would cough and sneeze if they have COVID-19, or they might well, the problem is that even if they just breathe and they're completely asymptomatic, their breath eventually fills up the space. So if you spend you know, a, a couple of hours or an hour in a grocery store, that is going to put you at some risk if there's significant contamination with COVID-19 in the air there. And of course, much more if you go to a barber shop, if you go to which is a smaller space, if you go to your workplace and spend you know, eight hours there, that's going to be pretty bad. So those are there are a number of indoor spaces that are much more concerning than we tend to think they are. You know, something that's um, that I think about a lot that I feel is under underappreciated in sort of like I don't know if it's psychological thinking or modern thinking or whatever the category we want we want to ascribe to it is but it's just sort of the concept uh, the concept of integration that you know many many things are connected and so we can focus to the point right a lot of a lot of a, a lot of business people are saying if all if we only listen to the health experts that's true we might be you know fewer people might die but on the other hand you know persistent 15 to 20 to 25 percent unemployment it's not just that it's bad it's that it leads to mental health issues it leads to civic unrest right it leads to people doing bad things it probably leads to an increased uh, dramatic increases in crime and so it's really hard to look at something from any one perspective and just say well it's going to be 15 percent unemployment through the end of 2021 we'll have yeah. to deal with it because as you know as some people sometimes say the 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 cure can't be worse than the disease mm-hmm. and all yes. of these different factors are interconnected so it's not like we can just take one factor in isolation and say that's the only thing we can solve for how do you feel about that about the fact that like listen if we have to stomach, you know, 20% unemployment through the end of 2021, a lot of terrible things are going to happen beyond people dying from coronavirus. Oh, I certainly think that's, it's a huge concern. I very much don't want unemployment in 15, 20%. I just think it's inevitable because what you're seeing is that people are not willing to go out to a lot of places and spend their money and while they're worried and concerned about anxious about COVID-19. So as you're opening up various venues, people are anxious. They're not going out. They're not spending their money. So you can't make them spend their money if they, if they are not uh, willing to spend their money and you're still getting unemployment. So if you don't increase people's sense of safety, you won't get them to spend money. And this is so one of those you know, doom loops where if you don't open up places, then of course people will not be wanting to spend their money. The solution out of this doom loop is for people to really shift their perspectives and focus much more on virtual interactions, much more on virtual activities. And that's what I've been talking about. That's what I already mentioned on this podcast. And in the book, I talk extensively about shifting our economy and being more creative 
to being sort of distanced interactions, socially, not simply socially distanced, but all sorts of virtual interactions, focusing on virtual workplaces, everyone working at home. And this is, you know, when I talk about this to my uh, consulting coaching clients, they were first looking at me and they were, you know, not uh, thrilled with this idea of their, uh, I mostly work with middle market companies and some with uh, Fortune 500 companies, a few startups, and they all almost all of them were really hesitant about people working at home, but I pushed them to do it and eventually they all shifted or they were forced to shift by government decrees, but most of them went before the government. And they found that people, teams working at home had many less troubles, many less problems than they thought they did. So right now they're all downsizing their their office, their real estate space. I mean, the commercial real estate is going to be really badly off, so there's no question about it. But they're basically either getting rid of their real estate space altogether or very much downsizing it to such a state that you know, there's not going to be more than a, one or two people in the office at any one time to just take care of basic paperwork, do things like checks and so on. Those things are all being transitioned. They're all really focusing on setting up virtual teams for businesses. And there's a lot of virtual activities that you can do as an individual that don't put you at risk while still get the economy going. So it's not an either or, it's a how to do both. How to do both in a way that keeps that maximizes safety while maximizing income. And that's virtual interactions. As a cognitive behavioral, you know, as, as a doctor that's studying cognitive bias and, and studying human decision making, does it concern? I mean, I guess I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming the answer is somewhat yes, but I guess my question is about the scope and scale of your concern. When I look at how the human race has responded to this global pandemic, it gives me great pause for the future of our civilization. And, you know, there's, um, I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, Fermi's paradox, which is if aliens are out there, why haven't they contacted us? And a big reason, a big, a big rationale is, well, because they tend to blow themselves up. Intelligent species tend to uh, eradicate their civilization before they have achieved the possibility of interstellar travel. Mm -hmm. Does it worry you about our about our our race, about the human race, about Homo sapiens, that we seem unable to effectively coordinate with each other on a matter that is so clearly urgent and life and death, and that political lines have been drawn so quickly, where you know it's not even clear that if the Chinese develop a vaccine that they'll share it with the U.S. or there will be some provision around it, and you know the U.S. can't even within the United States we can't even have a coherent uniform policy around how to approach the coronavirus, and every state is doing it somewhat differently. Does it give you concern about the human race? Well, first of all, thank you for bringing up the Fermi paradox, Sam. This is, I have to say, this is the first time in a podcast that someone has brought that up. And, you know, I'd love to geek out on it sometime, <laughs> Probably not, not while your audience is listening. But yes, that is definitely a concern. And I think about Fermi's paradox a lot because it is the, it's about existential risk. What kind of risk do we take that essentially causes the human race to either blow itself up completely all die out or go back to you know barbaric civilization <laughs> that that's the sort of risks that we're facing and that's the fermi paradox you know why has nobody contacted us and there are a number of potential explanations which i won't go into with the fermi paradox but the bigger question is about the concern with the human race you know what i think that what i'm more concerned about is not the human race but America, <laughs> because there are some countries that responded very well to the COVID-19. South Korea, as I mentioned, is an example where, you know, country, very, you know, it's a very big global country. It's 60 million people, big player, responded really well to COVID-19. So, you know, 60 million people, 300 deaths. If, if we responded that well, we'd have less than 1,500 deaths. There are other countries in the Western world that responded really well. Germany is an example of a country that responded really well. It uh, has something like 80 million, and it's certainly more similar culturally to the U.S. You know, if you think about any countries that are similar to the U.S., the U.K. and Germany, those would be the two, con two countries that are most similar to the U.S., uh, well, Canada also. So UK, Canada, and Germany. So if you think about those countries, Canada, and especially Germany, has responded really well. The UK has not. Canada and Germany, but especially Germany, has responded really well. It has something like 8,000 people who are dead. And of course, if we were in comparatives, then 
comparative populations, we'd have less than 25,000 people dead. So that's a really great response by Germany. So there are countries that are government systems, and it, it, the interesting thing is it has held together. There's not nearly as much polarization, not nearly as much conflict in Germany. Also Canada, it has some more problems with higher death rates in Germany, but not nearly as bad as the UK or the US. And it has held together politically. There's very much consensus. In the US, we have not held together politically as there's so much disagreement, so much conflict, so much tensions that I think it's more specifically about our own system. And the COVID-19 situation is showing the kind of huge, huge risks that the U.S. is running. We are very much oriented toward not minimizing risks, even though we should, by having the kind of political polarization and allowing the kind of destruction of focus on truth, on expert judgment, expert evaluation, where really in this situation, you want to be listening to the experts. And I don't mean simply the health experts here. I mean economic experts too. You know, if I had to choose the two kinds of experts to listen to, I choose on the one hand health experts, on the other hand economic experts, and have a consensus somewhere in the middle where you want to minimize deaths while minimizing economic damage and seeing where the they come together. Like I said, virtual interactions is definitely a great way to come together that solves a lot of problems at once. And it requires people to just change their mental habits, change the way that they do things. But that's a way to save lives and save money. So that that's, that's really important. That is what I strongly think. I think that our society is really not prepared, our society in particular, not simply the human race as a whole, is not prepared to deal well with a major crisis like this. And that's very troubling for me to see the society that I care about most as an American not being ready for this huge problem to hit it. I mean, there's so so many other problems can come along. COVID-19 is far from the worst kind of pandemic that can come along. There There are government engineered viruses in bio labs that are so much worse than COVID-19, so much worse. They have not simply a more high fatality rate, but they also have the same contagion rate or worse. They have worse because they can get through a number of routes of contagion. They can, they'll, they'll stay in the body like HIV stays in the body, COVID-19 doesn't. And there are so many other sort of problems, the, the people who don't show symptoms for, you know, two weeks and then they start dying and while well, st- well, infecting everyone. There's so many worse scenarios in COVID-19. And I really hope that COVID-19 serves as a wake-up call to our society, to our businesses, to individuals, to governments. I'm not sure if it will, but I really yeah, hope it does. It's not. It's, I don't think it is. Uh, do you think it's a failure of our system of government? Do you think it's a failure of media? What do you, when you say, when you separate Germany from the United States, what do you think the key distinction is? Is it values? Why, why do you think that we didn't respond in a way that you would feel is, is the right way to respond? I think it's a combination of government and uh, value. So in terms of governing system, uh, Germany has a much more cohesive united system. The U.S. Has a, very, has a political system, a governing system that creates a great deal of tension between two opposing parties. And these parties create more and more polarization. Of course, that's a big problem. In Germany, you have a number of parties competing for power, and you don't have such polarization between two parties, two camps, you know, the red and blue. That's not a thing that you have in Germany. You have various parties that can all come together and form alliances. That's a much more cohesive united system. It breeds unity, creates more unity for consensus governance rather than the US system, which breeds polarization. That's one. Second, the individualistic nature of the US system is quite problematic because you have individuals who are saying, well, I read a Wikipedia article and therefore I know better than the economic experts and the health experts and everybody else. And, you know, people are too high up on their own opinion. They don't realize the kind of importance that of expertise, the value of expertise and listening to experts. I'm very fortunate and thankful to be living in Ohio, where the governor, DeWine, actually does listen to health experts and despite a number of people pushing him in one way or the other, either to protect health too much or protect economics too much, he's trying to draw a middle road while listening to experts very thoroughly, very clearly. That's 
many governors do not and you know, many politicians do not. And that's a big concern for me where you experts are excellent at risk management. They can tell you that these are the worst courses. Don't don't go there. But you see a lot of politicians taking the worst courses and you see a lot of business leaders taking the worst courses. I mean, look at what Elon Musk is doing, trying to push against the government restrictions to open up the factory in California. That's a really bad idea. I mean, he said in a, you know, early March, the, on March 6th, he tweeted that the coronavirus panic is dumb. And then on March 19th, he tweeted that, you know, based on current trends, close to zero new cases in the U.S. by the end of April. You know, obviously he wasn't correct in both of those tweets, but he keeps pushing, he keeps going against the actual estimates, the actual reality, actual health experts. And he has a lot of money. He has a lot of influence, a lot of sway. So there are a number of business leaders who, of course, listen to him and who don't trust health expertise or economic experts doing the right things and taking the right path for the future and the benefit of our society. Yeah, it's a bummer. We could talk about it for a lot longer, um, but we're almost at the end of our time together for today. So my last question for you, Leb, hopefully we can we can uh, end on a more positive note, but what can we do in the future to, to better prepare for, for future disasters, whether pandemics or other types of disasters? And, you know, what, what lessons can we take and, and what practical advice can you give us so that in the future we respond more effectively? What you want to do is make sure to create a future-oriented strategic plan that's not simply a simplistic strategic plan where you just think, hey, this is what will happen and here's what I will do. That's not the way a good strategic plan works. That's not what you should really be doing. What you need to be doing as part of a strategic plan is draw out a number of possible future scenarios. So with COVID-19, you can plan for something like what's the optimistic scenario, what's the moderate scenario, and what's the pessimistic one. The optimistic one might say, you know, most people will be vaccinated by the end of 2021. The moderate one might say most people will be vaccinated by the end of 2024. The pessimistic one might say most people will be vaccinated by the end of 2027. And then you which make you look at yourself and look at your business, look at your household, look at your finances in each of these scenarios and what you would do to address problems in them and seize opportunities in them and take steps to address problems and seize opportunities. Look what kind of information would guide you into each of these scenarios and then evaluate the information as it comes forward and as you're going into the future to see which scenario you're actually heading toward. That's a specific principle of specific strategic plan of responding to COVID-19. And as part of the scenario, you should be scanning the future for a whole variety of problems. You know, COVID-19 is something that was definitely predictable. The A lot of people, when they first heard about it, you know, it was in some back pages about some backwood city in China developing, you know, Wuhan, China developing something. Uh, you know, probably people thought that it wouldn't reach them. Well, guess what? Wuhan is called the Chicago of China. It has 11 million people, produces over $22 billion in revenue, and has something like 250 international flights a day, carrying, you know, probably something like 10,000 people in and out of China. It definitely influences you. It impacts you. you got to be aware and scan the environment for various types of hazards, various types of disasters to protect yourself and your organization going forward. And you can if you manage risks effectively. And that's the perspective, the realistic pessimistic perspective and the risk management perspective that you very much want to take and pursue in order to make the right decisions and make sure that you survive and thrive in our uncertain and ambiguous future. It makes a lot of sense. Dr. Gleb, thanks for being on the show. Tell us the name of the book again, and is it available on Amazon and everywhere the books are sold? It is absolutely available everywhere books are sold. Resilience, adapt and plan for the new abnormal of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. And you can learn more about me at disasteravoidanceexperts.com with blogs, videos, podcasts, decision-making guides, manuals, decision aids, consulting, coaching, and training, virtual, of course, right now. <laughs> and especially check out disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe for a free eight video-based module on making the wisest decisions. Again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe, free course on making the wisest decisions made out of eight video-based modules. And finally, if you have any questions about anything you've heard me say in this podcast, check out and connect with me on LinkedIn. That's my favorite social media, Dr. Gleb Sapursky on LinkedIn, G-L-E-B-T-S-I-P-U-R-S-K-Y. Dr. Gleb, thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you on Friday for Friday Fundamentals. Thank you so much, Sam.
Hey folks, Sam Jacobs. I uh, hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Gleb Sapersky. I, I'm always fascinated by the concept of cognitive bias. I'm always fanc- fascinated by the concept that, you know, our brains as organs and our bodies and our processes and our chemistry, they've all evolved over not just thousands of years, but millions of years, millions of years. And we can't always trust our gut or our intuition. And we have to we have to think more intellectually and more structurally about how we approach different different issues. And I know that's a problem in my life and it's a problem in a lot of people's lives. The, the big book that I think you should read, no offense to Dr. Gleb, Dr. Gleb's amazing, but the famous work has been done by uh, hopefully somebody that you know, Daniel Kahneman, who wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow. And he worked with Amos, what is his last name, Kahneman? Amos Sversky and uh, and Danny Kahneman and Amos, they really, again, 60s and 70s and 80s, they, they pioneered and really brought to light all of the different fallacies that our minds trick us into. Now, the issue sometimes with cognitive bias is that you have like these biases that people label and they're like directly oppositional. So like there's the, you know, there's an optimism bias and a pessimism bias. There's a recency bias and a too long ago bias. So it's sometimes it's tr- it's tough to figure out how exactly to act because it's like, oh, well, when you do that, that's the loss aversion, but then there's the gain seeking. Anyway, the point is that, well, there's no point, I'm just rambling. The real point is that we have to understand how our brains work so that we can better make more informed decisions and not exclusively rely on simple intuition because simple intuition and Danny Kahneman specifically shows this across thinking fast and slow. And then, you know, if you read Michael Lewis's book, The Undoing Project, which is all about Kahneman and Sversky, just about how you, you really, our brains don't really understand math implicitly and they really don't understand big numbers. There's no intuition around statistics. Statistics and our brains do not work well together. And so we need to learn about that so that we can make better decisions and not fall victim to our primitive minds. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the conversation. I thought it was cool. Let's thank our sponsors. The first sponsor is LinkedIn, incredible company. LinkedIn Sales Navigator is a relationship-based digital selling tool designed to help you improve your sales pipeline, strengthen customer relationships, and acquire new opportunities. So go to sales.linkedin.com to try it out for yourself. If you haven't heard of LinkedIn Sales Navigator, I'd be very surprised. Our second sponsor is Outreach, the number one sales engagement platform. Outreach revolutionizes customer engagement by moving away from solid conversations to a streamlined and customer-centric journey. If you haven't yet applied to Revenue Collective, what are you waiting for? Go to revenuecollective.com, click apply now. If you haven't created a profile for yourself on Sales Hacker, go to saleshacker.com and do just that. If you have any questions for me, linkedin.com forward slash the word in forward slash Sam F. Jacobs, or you can email me, sam at revenuecollective.com, and I'll talk to you next time.